you know, where I, co where I come from, I'm not considered average. You know, um, being a spy, you have to show a certain amount of vigor. Have you never met a man before? I mean, what about your father? I had no father. My mother sculpted me from clay, and I was brought to life by Zeus. Well, that's neat. Sorry. Where I come from, babies are, are made differently. <laughs> you refer to reproductive biology? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know all about that. I mean, I refer to that in, in other things. The pleasures of the flesh. Do you know about that? I've read all 12 volumes of Cleo's treatises on bodily pleasure. All 12, huh? Mm -hmm. Did you bring any of those with you? You would not enjoy them. I don't know, maybe. No, you wouldn't. Why not? They came to the conclusion that men are essential for procreation, but when it comes to pleasure, Unnecessary. No, no. In a world overflowing with movies, we need a hero. Someone to separate the bad from the good. Sounds like a job. Hi everyone, I'm Em and welcome to Verbal Diorama episode 246, Wonder Woman. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. And as always, welcome to Verbal Diorama. Whether you are a regular returning listener, whether you're an irregular returning listener, or whether you are a brand new listener to this podcast, thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast among all of the other podcasts that you could be listening to right now. I'm so happy to have you here just generally, but also for the history and legacy of Wonder Woman. Before we get into that, I just want to say, as always, thank you so much to everyone who has, well, listened to this podcast and supported this podcast, everyone who listened to Animation Season 2024, and everyone who's listened through into the fifth birthday of this podcast, which was a few weeks ago. It's crazy that I've been doing this podcast for five years, the majority of which sitting at this desk, in this house, in the middle of the UK, every week, sometimes more than once a week, sometimes not every week, as in break week last week. And speaking of which, the last episode before my break week was Sleeping Beauty, which seems to have had a lot of love. So I'm delighted with the reception to Sleeping Beauty and really to all of the animation season episodes, but we are out of animation season now. We are into live action season which is not a thing but we are back into the live action movies for the time being and because it's international women's day tomorrow as of the release of this episode i wanted to focus on a character who represents feminism women's rights gender equality and also actually reproductive rights which i'm going to be coming to there's no fictional character as used as often to represent all of these things on international women's day then the character of Wonder Woman. And Wonder Woman was the only one of DC's top tier heroes to not have her own solo headline movie after Superman, which came out in 1978, and Batman in 1989, and their numerous sequels up until this point. With the MCU blazing a trail for the superhero cinematic renaissance, the race to get the first female headlining superhero movie was on. It was a race that DC won. Rather wonderfully, actually. Here's the trailer for Wonder Woman. I used to want to save the world. This beautiful place. But 
the closer you get, the more you see the great darkness within. I learned this the hard way a long, long time ago. What is your mission? To stop the war. What war? The war to end all wars. Weapons far deadlier than you can ever imagine. The war can be ours. Wherever you are, you are in more danger than you think. I cannot stand by while innocent lives are lost. Be careful, Diana. Who is this woman? She's my, um, secretary, sir. She's a very good secretary. It is our sacred duty to defend the world. And it's what I'm going to do. Although, I am not opposed to engaging in a bit of fisticuffs, should the occasion arise. When war spy and pilot Steve Trevor crashes on a secluded island paradise, he's saved from drowning by Diana, Princess of the Amazons. After he helps fight off the German soldiers chasing him, he tells of the war raging across the world, the war to end all wars. And based on the stories she was told as a child, Diana believes that humanity is being influenced by Ares, the god of war, and requests to be able to leave with Steve to fight Ares. Leaving behind the only life she's ever known and entering the cynical world of men for the first time, torn between saving one person and saving humanity, and finally stopping the reign of Ares once and for all. Let's run through the cast of this movie. We have Gal Gadot as Diana Prince, Chris Pine as Steve Trevor, Robin Wright as Antiope, Danny Houston as Eric Ludendorff, David Thewlis as Sir Patrick Morgan, Connie Nielsen as Hippolyta, Elena Anaya as Dr Isabel Maru, Lucy Davis as Etta Candy, Saeed Tagmawi as Samia, Ewan Bremner as Charlie, and Eugene Braverock as Chief. Wonder Woman has a screenplay by Alan Heinberg, Story by Zack Snyder, Alan Heinberg and Jason Fuchs was directed by Patty Jenkins and based on Wonder Woman by William Moulton Marston and Harry G. Peter. So the mid-90s was a strange time for superhero movies or comic book adaptations. They weren't the lavish superhero spectacles of today, but often relied on their pulpy origins, campness and or humour. Barb Wire and The Phantom both came out in 1996 and both suffered at the box office. At that time, production had begun on an adaptation of a Malibu comics title called Men in Black, which would go on to huge success in 1997. At the same time, Wesley Snipes was signing on to headline Marvel's Blade, which would retain the humour, but would also bring the genre's dark visuals and literal blood raves. And shortly after, Richard Donner would move forward with producing X-Men which would release in 2000 and be cited as the movie that kick-started the blockbuster superhero genre. But at the same time, Ivan Reitman had signed on to produce and possibly direct a feature for Warner Brothers, based on their popular character Wonder Woman. Because while DC's tentpole heroes Superman and Batman had both already graced the big screen several times, with a few sequels and with a couple of lead actor changes, Wonder Woman had still only been a small screen hero, made most famous by Linda Carter. Reitman's Wonder Woman would have been written by John Cohen and potentially star Sandra Bullock. Reitman's version would never come to fruition, of course, and nor would any other attempt, including by Joss Whedon and George Miller, 
which I'll come to. But the question remains, while her male counterparts have starred in blockbuster films, animated television shows and significant comic book events, why has it taken decades for the most enduring and well-known female superhero to get her own movie? And all that originates from her backstory. For most superhero origin stories, you know the backstory of the character. You know Bruce Wayne's parents were murdered in front of him as a child. You know that Peter Parker was bitten by a radioactive spider. And you know that Kal-El was the last son of Krypton, sent to Earth and adopted by Jonathan and Martha Kent. But Diana, Princess of Themyscira, just doesn't have that unifying origin story that everyone knows. And the story she does have isn't marred by any sort of tragedy or loss that any of the other origin stories mentioned before have. For example, loss of parents, loss of uncle, loss of homeworld. But there are a few key aspects that have remained since William Moulton Marston created her in 1941. Marston famously also invented the polygraph by creating the systolic blood pressure test. This was influenced by his wife, Elizabeth Holloway Marston, who suggested a connection between emotion and blood pressure. But Elizabeth wasn't the only influential woman in his life, and nor was she the only inspiration for the character of Wonder Woman, because William and Elizabeth had a polyamorous life partner, Olive Byrne. This relationship was kept secret for many years, and they told census takers that Olive was Elizabeth's widowed sister-in-law to explain their living situation. Byrne was actually the niece of Margaret Sanger, the birth control activist, sex educator, and the creator of the US's first birth control clinic, in 1916. That centre would go on to become Planned Parenthood. In the early 1940s, comics were dominated by male characters, and Marston, who had been hired as an educational consultant for national periodical publications and all American publications, the two companies which would later merge to form DC Comics, introduced an idea to Max Gaines, the co founder of All American Publications. Marston's idea was for a new kind of superhero. One who would conquer not with fists or firepower, but with love. Marston was living with two unconventional, liberated and idealistic modern women in Elizabeth and Olive, feminists of their day, and the idea to create a new superhero had endless possibilities. Elizabeth is reported to have said of the new hero, fine, but make her a woman. And so Suprema, the Wonder Woman, was born. The Suprema part was removed and she debuted in All-Star Comics No. 1 in December 1941 and received her own title in July 1942. The stories were initially written by Marston and illustrated by newspaper artist Harry G. Peter. Marston's intentions for the character were clear. Quote, Wonder Woman is psychological propaganda for this new type of woman who should, I believe, rule the world. The only hope for civilization is the greater freedom, development and equality of women in all fields of human activity, unquote. Following Marston's passing in 1947, DC Comics seemed to be unable to remain faithful to his original vision. The elements of her past, such as being formed of clay, the Amazons, Queen Hippolyta and Steve Trevor persisted, but the narrative was presented very differently. Themyscira and Amazonian cultures were occasionally held up as advanced beacons of hope symbols. At other times, they were portrayed as closed off and emotionally detached or as troubling feminist stereotypes. Wonder Woman herself has been stripped of all her abilities over the years, evolved into a super spy and completely abandoned her superhero life to marry Steve Trevor. Her early years were influenced by first wave feminism and the suffragette movement, her identity has become more messy because she is inextricably linked to the feminist movement and is frequently pressured to embody every aspect of femininity in a way that other female superheroes like Captain Marvel or Black Widow, who I'm coming to, have not. Mapping Wonder Woman's complex ancestry is mapping American feminism's history, as well as the ways in which women negotiate power in a society that rejects them. She's simultaneously not feminist enough, or she's too feminist. She either perpetuates the obsession with exalting white womanhood or is a fantastic advancement for intersectional portrayals of all womanhood. She's either a magnificent example of female bravery or an over-sexualised pin-up. Such high standards would never be expected of Superman or Batman, but they are of Wonder Woman and seemingly only Wonder Woman. Her origin story would change over the years as new writers took over, starting with the continuity-wide reboot of DC Comics with Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985. 
1987, Greg Potter, George Perez and Len Wein were tasked with the challenging assignment of modernising Wonder Woman while maintaining the essence of her character created by Marston. Her revised origin story is set up in the first volume, Gods and Mortals. The five years that Perez wrote and penciled the comic allowed for the development of all the recurring themes. The most significant aspect of this is how feminine her origins are. Women are the ones who create Diana from clay, give her life and power and raise her. In 2012, the New 52 timeline saw Wonder Woman as the demigoddess daughter of Queen Hippolyta and Zeus, with her original origin used to protect her from the wrath of Hera. And the reason I'm mentioning these three in particular is because inspiration for this movie was taken from William Moulton Marston's 1940s stories, George Perez's 1980s stories, as well as the often derided New 52 incarnation of the character. So, back to trying to get her movie off the ground. What the woman had been in the public consciousness since the 1975 television movie the new original Wonder Woman, starring Linda Carter, after a 1974 TV pilot starring Kathy Lee Crosby wasn't picked up for series. The TV series starring Linda Carter ran from 1976 to 1979. This portrayal of the character strongly influenced the Wonder Woman comics, most notably the ballerina-style spinning transformation, which was Carter's idea, and this was then incorporated into the comics. The attempt by Ivan Reitman in 1996 had failed, and in 2001, Todd Olcott was hired to write a screenplay with Mariah Carey, Kate Beckinsale and Catherine Zeta-Jones as potential stars. This would have been produced by Silver Pictures, obviously founded by Joel Silver. That screenplay went through several iterations before it was announced in 2005 that Joss Whedon would write and direct Wonder Woman. This would have been a few years after Firefly, a couple of years after Buffy ended, a year after Angel ended, and the same year Serenity was released. His script, which had Kobe Smulders in mind for the part, would be widely seen as misogynistic when it leaked. And while I'm not going to go into the plot in detail, there's a great episode of the podcast How Did This Not Get Made, which does go into it in some detail. And it is interesting, shall we say. Diana is basically a helpless woman who relies on being rescued by Steve Trevor. Whedon had left the project by 2007 after Warner Brothers and Silver rejected the script. A spec script for the movie written by Matthew Jennison and Brent Strickland was purchased by Joel Silver the day before Whedon left. Their script, which takes place during World War II, won over executives, but Silver acknowledged that while the script had some good ideas, he had bought it because he wanted to keep the rights and he did not want the Wonder Woman movie to be a period piece. Let's put a pin in that and come back to it. Smulders would go on to voice Wonder Woman in the Lego Batman movie and Whedon would step up to direct Justice League, which also came out in 2017 after the death of Zack Snyder's daughter. The same year, Warner Brothers started development on Justice League Mortal to be directed by George Miller, with Megan Gale cast as Wonder Woman in January 2008. That film would also be cancelled. Gale would go on to be cast in Miller's Mad Max Fury Road, just in case anyone thought the director of Babe, Pig in the City and Happy Feet couldn't do high adrenaline, high action. And obviously I jest, because he's very well known for Mad Max. There was also an animated film in 2009 starring Kerry Russell and Nathan Fillion that's widely praised as being one of the best versions of the character. Nicholas Winding Refn also expressed interest in directing a live-action version in 2010 and David E. Kelly famously created a TV pilot for NBC in 2011 starring Adrian Palicki, but it didn't get picked up to season. By this point, so this is 2010-2011, the MCU was starting to gather a pace, and in the early 2010s, Warner Brothers announced a slate of films in development, including The Flash, Aquaman and Wonder Woman. And by 2013, Wonder Woman and Aquaman were both still slated for development. Even Paul Feig pitched for Wonder Woman in 2013, but the studio wanted a female director, and they had their sights firmly set on Michelle McLaren, who'd worked on Breaking Bad and Game of Thrones, but she would eventually leave citing creative differences, mostly because she wanted a huge Braveheart-style epic. Speaking of the MCU, though, as this is something that I mentioned in episode 129 on Thor The Dark World, and that is Patty Jenkins. Patty Jenkins had signed up to direct the sequel to Thor and would have become the first female director to helm an MCU movie. 
Jenkins wanted to make a Romeo and Juliet style epic love story for Thor and Natalie Portman was delighted with her appointment as director. But Marvel didn't want that direction and Jenkins was less than impressed with the script she was given to work with. She also saw the bigger picture, that if the Thor sequel turned out to be a dud, it wouldn't be Marvel at fault, or Kevin Feige, or any other man who worked on that movie, it would be her fault. The discourse around Thor The Dark World wasn't great with a male director, but had Patty Jenkins took the job, without the passion for the script, she would have been the scapegoat, and she knew it. So three months later, she and Marvel parted ways amicably, citing creative differences. But... This left Patty Jenkins open to take the Wonder Woman directorial job in 2015. And this was not long after filming had wrapped on Batman v Superman at Dawn of Justice, which is important because that movie had already cast Wonder Woman back in 2013, meaning Jenkins already had an actor in place, something she admitted being disappointed that she'd not been able to influence the casting of the character of Wonder Woman. Olga Kurylenko, Jamie Alexander and Elodie Young were considered for the role of Wonder Woman before Gal Gadot was cast. And while Gadot's initial casting announcement was criticised, with fans believing she was too slight to play the Amazonian, once Batman v Superman was released, she was singled out for praise. She had gone on to gain 17 pounds of muscle and practised a variety of martial arts, undergoing a strict diet and training regime. Jenkins was certain she would not have made the same choice for the casting of the character, but as she got to know Godot and watch her perform, she realised Zack Snyder had found someone perfect and compared Godot's casting as Diana to Christopher Reeve's casting as Superman. Patty Jenkins disliked Joss Whedon's take on Justice League in particular because Whedon reshot the movie to the point where the character of Wonder Woman was not portrayed as she had been in earlier films despite the fact that she and Zack Snyder collaborated to maintain continuity between the films by, for example, leaving Wonder Woman's costume unchanged. And for the first female-led superhero movie of the modern age, of a character steeped in feminism, the film featured a slew of female crew, including set director Anna Lynch Robinson, costume designer Lindy Hemming, VFX producer Amber Kirsch and production designer Aline Bonetto, in addition to its female lead, large female cast and director, and executive producer Rebecca Seal Roven and producer Deborah Snyder calling the shots behind the scenes. Chris Pine, probably the most underrated cinematic Chris, was confirmed as playing Steve Trevor and relished the period design, costuming and set pieces, all of which I'm going to come to a little bit later. Jenkins also cast a diverse selection of different athletes, ranging from an Olympic bobsledder to a professional boxer to fill the roles of the Amazonian warriors. The women trained together in London for several weeks where they learned sword play and stunt choreography. While the Themyscirans looked fierce and fearless, it turned out the costumes were highly impractical for bathroom breaks. The goal of Lindy Hemming's costume design was to give the Amazon warriors a mythological yet contemporary appearance. She took cues from modern sportswear and classical Greece for their styles, she took inspiration from the female warriors and leaders of several Mediterranean civilizations, but found it difficult to locate references to female warriors' armour, and so she decided to base her designs on the breastplates and leg shins worn by men in ancient Greece. Principal photography began in November 2015, concluding in May 2016, with reshoots taking place in November 2016, with Godot five months pregnant at the time. Her pregnancy was edited out of the movie in post-production, but Godot found it incredibly difficult to shoot the new scenes while pregnant and was suffering from regular sickness at the time. The film was shot in England, France and Italy, with the scenes in Themyscira shot on the Silentan coast, a stretch of coastline on the Tyrrhenian Sea located in the province of Salerno in southern Italy. It was chosen for its beautiful blue-green sea, high cliffs and a coastline that doesn't disappear with the tides and was chosen out of 47 different locations. One of the most iconic scenes when Diana steps into no man's land was Patty Jenkins' personal favourite and has since embodied the spirit of the movie and of the character. As Diana bravely walks across a stretch of land between the English and German trenches in order to reach a village on the other side and rescue its people from German forces. But executives weren't keen because Wonder Woman wasn't fighting anyone or anything. So to sell it, Jenkins storyboarded the sequence herself to persuade everyone that this was the character's pivotal moment, that this would cement Diana as Wonder Woman. 
that this wasn't about Diana fighting German soldiers or killing German soldiers. It's purely about getting to these innocent civilians across no man's land. They dug real trenches on location at Leveson Studios and filmed during the winter months, which meant uncertain conditions and low temperatures. While No Man's Land was her favourite shot, the hardest shot to film was actually the German High Command Gala. The shots of Diana and General Ludendorff dancing were the hardest to get because the sequence was shot inside Hatfield House, where the crew couldn't attach any equipment to the walls or ceiling. To get close-ups of the stars while they danced, the crew had to build a 360-degree track around them for the camera. Jenkins chose to shoot on 35mm film instead of digital video to get the, quote, epic, grander escapism, unquote, and wanted to capture the tone of 80s adventure films. And the look was inspired by painter John Singer Sargent, who was known for his turn-of-the-century war paintings, specifically the painting Gassed, a depiction of the survivors of a mustard gas attack during World War I. He didn't tend to use a lot of colour, but when he did, it was vibrant. So Jenkins deliberately avoided the standard techniques used for shooting period films, like colours that are a little desaturated or bleeding together and warm sepia tones. They had a modern use of colour throughout the whole movie and modern techniques in terms of the lensing to tell the story. And in many ways, the period really came from the production design, the costumes and the vehicles and details. The Veld set was built from the ground up and required minimal visual effects, but the destruction of the church was digitally completed. When promoting Wonder Woman 1984, the sequel to Wonder Woman, Kathy Jenkins admitted that the final act, Ares Reveal, and the CGI fight was studio-mandated. Jenkins originally wanted a much more subdued ending with a human Ares fighting Diana, but in a much less bombastic and grandiose visual effects spectacle. Warner Brothers would force Jenkins to change it last minute. She would stand by the new ending in interviews claiming to love it, but admitted it wasn't her intended ending. When it came to the First World War, Gas was intended to win the war, and on that much, Wonder Woman is horrifically accurate. In the film, General Ludendorff sees Dr. Poison's gas as the way to strike a decisive, deadly blow against the British. In real life, barbed wire and machine guns had brought the war to a stalemate of trench warfare, and it was up to scientists and engineers to find a solution. The resulting inventiveness yielded some good things, inventions like synthetic rubber and ultrasound. But it also brought new, horrific forms of destruction, including lethal gas and the strategic bombing of civilian targets. The earliest gas attacks during World War I were carried out using artillery shells that were loaded with tear gas. The objective was to force the enemy out of the trenches, but there was not enough gas available to hit the target. The Germans stepped up gas warfare by making chemicals on an industrial scale. Before the war, German chemists had led the world, particularly in artificial dyes. Poisonous chlorine gas was a byproduct of their chemical industry, which meant huge quantities were just sitting in warehouses. In April 1915, Germany stockpiled 6,000 cylinders of chlorine, containing more than 150 tonnes of gas in France. When the wind was blowing in the right direction, they released the gas against French colonial forces across a four-mile front. Canadian forces who counterattacked the next day were met by an even bigger attack, and the events were horrific. The green fog caused victims' lungs to fill up with fluid, effectively drowning them on dry land. Estimates of the number of dead ranged from 1,000 to 5,000, with many more seriously injured. Wonder Woman features mustard gas, which is much less deadly than other chemical weapons. The Germans called it the king of gases, though, because although it's not particularly lethal by comparison, it was very effective at disabling anyone inside the cloud of gas. A gas mask was useless against mustard gas. Mustard gas caused skin to blister on contact and breathing it made it even worse. General Eric Ludendorff was actually a real person and he was brutal, but not necessarily more than any other high commander. As the head of the German armed forces, he approved the use of mustard gas. Gas that could literally melt tissue, cause permanent or temporary blindness, cause damage to the lungs and excruciating pain when inhaled. Ludendorff grew frustrated with Adolf Hitler even before the Nazis actually took power. Unlike in Wonder Woman, the real Ludendorff lived for many years after the First World War and he also played a major role in the rise of Adolf Hitler. The movie features a type of mustard gas that is supposedly based on hydrogen which burns through gas masks and the Germans really did figure out a way to neutralise early gas masks. 
They mixed lethal chlorine with chloroformate tear gas. The filters blocked the chlorine but not the tear gas, which built up inside the gas mask until it became intolerable. And when the victim ripped the mask off to try to breathe, they would then succumb to the chlorine. And while this is a mostly fictional account of the atrocities of the First World War, the movie doesn't shy away from how life was. The fact that women weren't equal, the war affected everyone in different ways. Races didn't intermingle and heroes can't save everybody. To Diana's ultimate heartbreak. Diana fighting out of love and not hatred could be trite or insincere, but Ares' inability to see the human race as anything other than selfish and cruel, when we see examples to the contrary of this in many characters, shows how blinkered Ares is. And in a lovely twist of fate, Diana ends up working at the Louvre in Paris. There, a painting hangs called Liberty Leading the People, an 1839 oil canvas by Eugène Delacroix, commemorating the July Revolution which toppled King Charles X. It depicts an unnamed woman of the people, personifying the concept of liberty, leading a varied group of people forward over a barricade and the bodies of the fallen, holding aloft the flag of the French Revolution, the tricolore, which again became France's national flag after these events. She carries the flag in one hand and brandishes a musket with the other. Just as Diana does in this movie, leading the British forces across no man's land. And speaking of no man's land, welcome to my dating life. But also, <laughs> that's a funny joke for you. But also, it's time for the obligatory Keanu reference of this episode. And what that means is, this is the part of the podcast where I link the movie that I'm featuring with Keanu Reeves. Because no man is as great as Keanu. But that is a fact. So this movie was banned in Lebanon due to Gal Gadot's mandatory service in the Israeli Defence Forces. And you might be wondering, how can I link Keanu Reeves to that? Well, Keanu was born in Beirut, which is in Lebanon. Interestingly, the movie's also been banned in Algeria, Tunisia and Qatar for the same reasons. And again, speaking of No Man's Land, composer Rupert Gregson Williams found that writing the music for No Man's Land was the most difficult task that he had when scoring this movie. He followed Jenkins' instructions and took care to not make the score too aggressive. It took multiple rewrites for the piece that plays alongside Diana in the trenches. The symphony he ultimately chose approached the action from a more internal perspective. The hook from the piece Wonder Woman's Wrath would become Diana's theme in all future DC appearances. Australian singer Sia performed a song called To Be Human for the movie, which also featured English musician Labyrinth. The song, which was co-written by Rick Knowles and Florence Welsh, is also on the soundtrack. The Wonder Woman theme, Is She With You, from the Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice soundtrack, which was composed by Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL, is also sampled on the soundtrack. The world premiere of Wonder Woman took place at the Pantages Theatre in Los Angeles on the 25th of May 2017, attended by Gal Gadot, who had given birth to her daughter Maya just two months prior. Also attending was Linda Carter, who didn't have a cameo in the movie. She would in Wonder Woman 1984, but this was to show her support for the first cinematic outing of the character that made her famous in the 70s. Its release date was moved up from the 23rd of June to the 2nd of June 2017, and when it did release on the 2nd of June, it went to number one at the US box office, dethroning Poets of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, which is actually called Salazar's Revenge here. It stayed at number one in its second week, facing off Tom Cruise's terrible remake of The Mummy. And because no, I'm not a fan, I think that movie is awful. Wonder Woman dropped his second in its third week on the release of Cars 3. It stayed in the top 10 for nine weeks. On its $149 million budget, it would gross $412.6 million domestically in the US and $410.4 million internationally for a total worldwide gross of $823 million, well above the predicted $300 to $460 million it would have needed to break even. Financially, it was a huge success for DC, placing it in the top three DC movies in regards to box office performance worldwide, and DC's biggest box office gross domestically in the US. Critically, it was also one of DC's most highly praised movies, with 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, the top-rated DCEU movie on that site, with praise for Godot's performance, her chemistry with Chris Pine, his performance, the period setting, and it being the rare superhero movie that's not been designed to sell merchandise, and also Jenkins' direction. 
Many would go on to compare it to Captain America the First Avenger for many reasons, its period setting, but also the fact that a character called Steve, played by an actor called Chris, ends up crashing a plane. When it comes to sequels, Wonder Woman 1984 is a fun, albeit inconsistent sequel, and I still maintain, as much as I love Chris Pine and Chris Pine's Steve Trevor, that Steve Trevor should have stayed dead, because the unfortunate way he's resurrected in Wonder Woman 1984 is unfortunate. As for Wonder Woman 3, it remains in a weird state of limbo. Gal Gadot claimed DC heads James Gunn and Peter Safran told her they would develop Wonder Woman 3 together in August 2023. But with Gunn and Safran all but ignoring previous DC movies, it's unclear whether DC studios have plans at this time for any Gal Gadot headlined Wonder Woman project in the new DC universe. By the time 2017 rolled around, We'd had a few great female superhero characters in the MCU. Black Widow had been part of the Avengers, and of Tony Stark and Steve Rogers' sequels, we'd had Gamora as a vital part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, along with her sister Nebula, as a complex and interesting villain. Wanda Maximoff joined the Avengers in 2015 as one of the most powerful beings in the MCU. We'd been introduced to Hope Van Dyne, and it was set up by the end credit scene for Ant-Man, for Wasp to be the joint lead of an MCU movie. Whether she was content-wise is up for debate, but she was title-wise at the very least. But we'd also seen Marvel leave Gamora, Scarlet Witch and Black Widow out of toy sets, because Marvel corporate makes decisions purely based on toy sales. The women Marvel featured were usually well-developed, always badass and dynamic to watch on screen, but they were always sidekicks or minor characters or plot devices to get the male characters to do something. Marvel women instead found themselves leading adjacent TV shows and miniseries before female characters would start earning films of their own. Agent Carter and Jessica Jones paved the way for Marvel-centric programming dedicated to women's storytelling, and Wanda would end up headlining WandaVision in 2020. But we'd had no inkling of any solo female movie before 2019's Captain Marvel. Black Widow was the obvious choice, but Marvel would drag in their heels on the character, with discussions starting on a solo movie all the way back in 2010. So much so that when her movie eventually did release in 2021, it was affected by not only the pandemic, but also the fact that, spoiler alert for the MCU, her character had died on screen in 2019. And so this was all set after the events of Captain America's Civil War. My point is, by 2017, we were more than ready for a female superhero to come to the big screen. In fact, we were asking for it, we were clambering for it, this was what we wanted, and Marvel weren't delivering. Step up DC to the plate. Because unlike most superhero movies, Wonder Woman, with its First World War setting, felt grounded and its plotline of chemical warfare being surprisingly accurate to the real super weapons that were on play during the time. In a time where women-led superhero movies are almost always questioned on their validity and quality, I point to Madame Webb recently debuting to lackluster box office and reviews, and the age-old question of, can women lead a superhero movie? The answer is always yes. Wonder Woman thrived on being modern cinema's first female-led superhero movie in 12 years since 2005's Elektra. And the accolades kept coming. Not only was it the first live-action film with a woman director to have a budget of over $100 million, but it eventually became the highest-grossing film directed by a woman surpassing the previous records of Jennifer Yu Nelson's Kung Fu Panda 2 and Felida Lloyd's Mamma Mia, while also holding the record worldwide until High Mom surpassed it in 2021, followed by Barbie in 2023. As a Marvel girl through and through, I've always felt like they dropped the ball for women as leads. They left the door open for DC to take it. But Wonder Woman remains one of my favourite DC movies in an extended universe that I can mostly just give or take except for a few standout entries. This movie, The Suicide Squad, and Birds of Prey, both of which I have episodes on too. By the way, Birds of Prey is episode 70, and The Suicide Squad is episode 157. Wonder Woman genuinely feels separate to everything else. Its period setting gives it room to breathe, and for us to get to know the naive, innocent Diana before she's somewhat tainted by her association with everything that will come for the character in Batman v Superman and Justice League, it's sweet and funny, and the chemistry between Gal Gadot and Chris Pine anchors their sweet but brief relationship. 
Could it have leaned more into Wonder Woman versus the patriarchy? Sure. But considering women didn't get suffrage here in the UK until 1918 and in the US until 1920, it shows that sometimes a powerful superhero needs to step back and let the everyday heroes shine. There were still limits on the women who could actually vote, but that's not a conversation for now. My point is, when you have a fictional hero in a factual environment, sometimes you need to let actual history take its course. Diana is earnest, hopeful, loving, optimistic and spirited. This movie feels like DC is finally out of the trenches and it's a high point it will struggle to hit again. This is a landmark of modern superhero cinema, not just because it's good, but because Patty Jenkins, Gal Gadot and yes, even Zack Snyder in his association knew the assignment. It had to be great and it succeeded in doing so by being totally separate to everything else. It is a necessary cog in the DC machine, but it's also a historical watershed for representation of women in cinema. The women can be tough, can literally repel bullets to protect those they love, but that kindness, vulnerability and empathy doesn't come at the expense of leadership, power and being uncompromising and unwavering in life. Thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Wonder Woman. And as always, thank you for your continued support of this podcast. If you do want to get involved and help this podcast grow, you are just by listening to this podcast. But if you want to help it grow a little bit more, then you can by leaving a rating or review wherever you found this podcast. You can also help on social media by following me. I am at Verbal Diorama on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky and Letterboxd. And you can find posts on there. You can repost them. You can like them. You can share them. Literally anything you can do to help Verbal Diorama get out there would be so appreciated. Or you can simply just tell your friends and family about this podcast and about this episode. And if you like this episode on Wonder Woman, you might also like the DC episodes that I've done. I've done very many, admittedly, because as I said, I am more of a Marvel girl. But episode 70, Birds of Prey. I love that movie so much. I think it's such a highlight in the DCEU. I think it's so much fun. And it came out at a really weird time because it was literally just before the pandemic. And unfortunately, not many people actually got to see that movie that deserve to see that movie. Please watch Birds of Prey. Please love Birds of Prey and listen to that episode. And episode 157, The Suicide Squad, speaking of James Gunn, who now leads DC, he did a movie called The Suicide Squad, which again, really suffered due to not many people seeing it. But it is genuinely a highlight in the DCEU. So much better than Suicide Squad. Although I do talk a little bit about Suicide Squad in that episode and the issues surrounding the making of Suicide Squad. But to me, the definitive Suicide Squad is the Suicide Squad. It's a brilliantly fun movie. As always, give me feedback. Let me know what you think of my recommendations. So the next episode, we're going to be having some quiet time. And no, it's not another break week. I'm sorry to disappoint, but some actual quiet time. A movie with limited dialogue and, in fact, very little sound at all. Because if you make a noise, the monsters will find you. The next episode is on the history and legacy of A Quiet Place. And it seems counterintuitive to create a podcast episode on A Quiet Place. However, it's a great movie. It felt very refreshing when it came out. And I'm really looking forward to being silent for 40 minutes for the next episode, just in case. So please join me next week for the history and legacy of A Quiet Place. Now, this podcast is free and it always will be free. But if you do want to help support this podcast financially, then you can. There are a couple of ways you can do it. You can go to verbaldiorama.com slash tips and give a one-off tip. Or you can go to verbaldiorama.com slash Patreon and you can subscribe to the Patreon for this podcast and join the amazing patrons of Verbal Diorama. They are Simon E, Sade, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Kat, Andy, Mike, Luke, Michael, Scott, Brendan, Lisa, Sam, Jack, Dave, Stuart, Nicholas, So, Kev, Pete, Heather, Danny, Ali, Stu, Brett, Philip, Michelle, and Zenos. If you want to get in touch, you can. You can email verbaldiorama at gmail.com or you can fill out the contact form at verbaldiorama.com and you can say hi. You can give me feedback or you can give me suggestions. And you can also find bits and pieces that I do over at filmstories.co.uk too. And finally. I can no, do it. No, Let no. Let me do it. It has to be me. It has to be me. I can save today. You can save the world.
I wish we had more time. What? What are you saying? I love you. You're wrong about them. They're everything you say, but so much more. Not about deserve. It's about what you believe. And I believe in love. Bye. Movie should know. Movie should know.